to a long time ago. Not a long time ago. It's a story about a powwow I went to. This was uh, a little under 10 years ago. I was dating a native girl, native lady. She had her own like native shop with her friend. And uh, we were dating for almost a year, I think. Yeah, almost a year. Yeah, almost a year. And um, she took me to a powwow. We went to a few powwows because she's native. She's half native. Um, so at the powwow, she was known because she has a native shop and people know her. She's been on the reserve like all her life. And her best friend was dating an elder. And this elder is known all across North America. He's the only elder or native to make a book like a, a native Bible, so to speak, with all the beliefs of every native tribe in North America, what their beliefs of God is, like whether it's the hawk or the eagle or the sun, or whatever their belief is, the wind, the smoke, God, whatever, right? I'm not even sure if those are ones, <laughs> just kind of making examples, but so he, he, he made this book, and he's almost done, it took him, I think, 10 years as well, like quite a while. I remember him telling me it was 12 years, something like that. I'm making this really long already. It's 3 in the morning. <laughs> um, so, yeah. At the powwow, they have a fire. It's called the Sacred Fire. And it's at the side of the powwow normally. It's not for people and tourists and stuff. At the dance ceremony, they call um, the little girls that walk around, they'll ask for tobacco offerings and they take it to the fire, the sacred fire. So if you need healing or you need health or you need, you know, success with your farm, whatever you wish, you kind of, that's what you do, right? So she kept telling me that when we're there to give tobacco to the tobacco girls and she's going to tell them ahead of time that I need healing with my bones because I had osteoporosis really bad and fractures. And when I was dating her, actually, we were just sitting down on, on out in her backyard and I got up off the bench wrong. It was a concrete bench, right? But I sat on it for like almost a year, right? I got up off it wrong and I fractured my tailbone. Um, so she saw some other health things I went through. So anyways, the tobacco girls come around, they grab the tobacco, they do, they do a dance, right? It's during the dance thing. Um, and then they take it over to the sacred fire where people aren't allowed to go. It's only for the dance girls and other members of the powwow and to keep the secret ceremony of the sacred fire going, right? There's a, a fire keeper that stands there to make sure it doesn't go out and protects it. They make a path of stones leading up to it and around it. So you have stones going on one side, stones going on the other side, and then it makes a circle around the fire and stones going back out like a path. And what some of them get to do is walk the sacred fire path. And when they walk down the path, they get to the fire. They make a choice to walk left around the fire or right around the fire and then continue out the path. And it's only a special thing that some people get to do if, with the fire keeper's permission. So near the uh, nighttime, of, before nighttime hit, it was still daytime, but like supper time, the elder took me over to the fire. They didn't tell me. He just goes, hey, come with me. And I came with him, and when he took me off to the side, he goes, listen, at the fire, it's a sacred fire, I've asked the chief, or the fire keeper, if you can come over, and you can walk the sacred fire, it might help with your healing, because that's where the girls brought your tobacco for the offering. And I was like, okay, yeah, let's go, let's check it out. So we went, and he goes, when you, he explained to me, you walk up the, the path, choose which side you want to go, and then continue on. He goes, I'll go first, and then you wait for the fire keeper who'll raise his hand. He won't, he, he won't speak, he'll just raise his hand and you go. Okay, so watch me. And then he went, and he raised his hand, he walked. I think he went left. And then the fire keeper looked at me, raised his hand, and motioned forward, right, like this. Right? So he only did it once. So I started walking, and just as I got to where I was going to make my, my decision, left or right, he puts up his hand like this to the sky and he goes, stop. And he said it really loud, right? Like, stop, like, really loud. And uh, he put his hand up and he was looking straight up to the sky. 
kind of like that, right? I don't know if you've seen it because it's dark. He puts his hand up to this guy, yells stop, he's staring at this guy. I look over at my buddy, my elder buddy, because I'm thinking right away, okay, this is a joke, this is some setup he's done, right? <laughs> but when I look at him, he's like white, man, he's, he's totally white, like three sheets to the wind, like he saw a ghost. So I knew he wasn't joking, right? The fire keeper. So when I look back at the fire keeper, he's still looking up at the sky, and he has his hands still up at the sky. And then he, he brings his hand down, he looks at me, and you can see his demeanor change, like he was happy. And then he, he, he motioned he, he, with his hand like this. And he goes, go through the fire. All right? And again, I thought he was joking, so I looked over at my native buddy, and he's still, like, his jaws dropped. He's all white complexion, blood left his face. So I looked back at the fire chief, and I walked over the coals of the fire right through it. The flames were, like, three feet high, man. It's like a fire, right? I came out the other side. No burn, no singe, no smell of hair burning anywhere, man. Like, nothing. It was very spiritual. Um, when I got out of the path at the end of it, he was waiting there and he was all shook up, right? You could tell. And I said to him, I said, how come I got to walk through the fire and you didn't? He goes, I don't know. And I said, oh, you must know, man. You must know what that means. He goes, no, I've never seen that before. But don't tell anybody. I'll find out, okay? But just don't tell anybody. And I was like, why would he not want me to tell anybody? And then I kind of put it together it's because he was so flustered. He didn't know what it means. It's a high spiritual significance thing, right? And I could see the chief and feel the chief. He was happy and smiling and he was glad that I was in his presence, right? Or that God came in his presence and let him allow me to walk the fire. And it was all like a unity thing, right? I could feel that from him, right? I could feel him like smiling and being happy. Not the chief, the fire keeper. Um, so yeah, for years and years, I tried to find out what it means. I've asked a lot of elders. I've asked, asked a lot of tribes. I've asked people online, uh, on the phone. Um, even when I've been on the reserve getting smokes, I've asked people, nobody knows what it means to walk through the fire, right? I didn't tell people, like many people, that uh, there was no hair burned, there was no singeing, my legs weren't hurt, my, my, my shoes weren't even burnt. I'm walking over right through the fire. It was like a foot and a half, two feet wide. You know, it's like a normal fire. So yeah, it was very spiritual and uh, so I'd, I'd share that story of a powwow. <laughs> I ain't never ever seen it go in. I quit smoking twice, so I'll quit again eventually. But I grew up with native friends, right? Because the reserve is right there. One of my best buddies was Mike Miracle. He was a native, right? bunch of native friends but one of my first friends when i was little right we hung around all, all the time and his mom was like really native like 100 percent native she was like spiritual right and quiet and she had good demeanor. so i always looked up to her right but she knew i was a troublemaker and i was i was a little badass when i was a kid right god changed me man all thanks to jesus you know, i would be, wouldn't be who i am right now uh, but yeah so growing up with my native friends, I was on the reserve a lot, you know, and when I was in my drinking days and all that stuff. And, but I could see the things that, would, that was different on the reserve that was different from the city. And they, they got shit. They got treated like shit. No one gave them the money. The, the, the chief of the village, he'd get money from the government and he's supposed to divide it up with people so they get up nice homes and all that. He wouldn't divide it up. He'd keep the majority of it for himself. So even like his, his, his screwing him over, right? And this is the the Mohawk. Um, I've had a lot of spiritual things out. That's another story. <laughs> but yeah, um, the one thing that happened with my buddy Jay. Spent the weekend out there at his mom's boyfriend's. And his mom's boyfriend holds shooting competitions, skeet shooting, when you shoot the skeet with the guns. And the best guy who was the champion, he wins every year, showed up and he was there, right? And this was like Saturday, we were there Friday. So Jay told me we'll be shooting skeet. And it's my first time ever doing it. So I was using all the guns and it was by afternoon when we broke for lunch. I was doing good, right? 
Because I'm a good shot. I grew up with guns, the BB guns and pellet guns, right? And my buddy had a 22. So after noon, when we ate, my shoulder was beat from getting all the shots from the gun and big bruises on it, right? So I looked at one of the other guns and it was like, look, reminded me of a 22. And I said to my buddy Jay, I said, what's that gun there? And he goes, oh, you don't want that, man. It's a pea shooter. It'd be impossible to hit it. And I said, is it a 22? He goes, yeah. And I said, here, let me see it. And he gave it to me and it had a cartridge in it. Oh, it cool. Here goes my coffee. So, uh, I was only like probably 14 or 15. So I grabbed this 22, right? And I said, pull. And, and I like waiting for the skeet to go really far. As soon as you pull, a lot of people wait for it to go high. And before it starts falling, they shoot. I like waiting for it to go really far to, so it's almost on the ground. And then I shoot it, right? So that's what I did. And I hit every one that, that they pulled. I only did two, right? But every, every time they, they did it, that whole afternoon I did it. And then the dude who was the champion, I didn't know he was the champion. I found this all out later. He comes over, he looks at me, he's like, He's all mean looking, right? And he walks and stomps over, walks over to the wall where the guns are, and he grabs two shotguns. And he walks back over, he looks at me and he goes, like he smiles, right? And then he holds the shotgun in his hand, both hands, and you know when they spin the gun, you spin the gun, right? You spin it and then shoot it. That's what he did with two shotguns. No safety on them or nothing. He spun them completely around 360. After he said, pull, he spun them around 360, both of them, and went boom, boom, and shot both skeets, right? It was amazing. It was cool, right? And he walks back over, and he looks at me, he goes, and puts the guns back on the wall. And I didn't know what the frick was going on. Like, why was he doing that, right? So at the end of the day, when we're back in the house, everyone was gone. There's still people inside, right? After everyone was gone out of the house, I asked them, I said, how come that guy did that? My, that's what my buddy Jay said. Well, he thought we brought you out here as a joke to show him up. That, you know, some young little guy shoots better than him because we don't know how you shot those skeets. Shooting a skeet with a 22 is, is basically impossible and you shot every one that, that old, like every time. So he thought we brought you out here and you're a professional shooter. That's what the deal was. I was just a little guy, man. First time shooting skeet. Yeah. Just another native story. But yeah, man, the native culture, it's, uh, it's in my blood. And I'm 100% Scottish, right? And it was the Europeans that came over here pretending to be Christians that slaughtered the heck out of them, giving, you know, Jesus a bad name, right? A lot of them are waking up to that fact. Some of them won't wake up to it because they used religion as a means to slaughtered people man sorry man I'll get upset I made this video kind of cool I'm out here I'm crying at the end it's uh it's just I don't know man it'll never settle in me it, when I learned that it was the Europeans that came over and did that to them and these are my buddies like it, I felt so much guilt I wasn't proud to be a Canadian I wasn't proud to be Scottish like I didn't like it at all I even told them, man, like, it's my blood, my set, my ancestors that came over here and did this to you, man. I gotta say sorry, you huh? And they'd be like, what are you talking about, man? It wasn't you. And some of them would be like, yeah, man, yeah, but it's not your problem. Ah, uh, what's that? But yeah, I think I'll end it on that. Not that I'm ashamed to show my tears, man. The real men cry. And they teach, they're teaching kids when I was like in my, in, in the 70s and 80s, telling them that men don't cry, don't show your tears and all that crap. Like, it, no wonder society's so thrown off with a lot of the cliches that we were growing up with. Like if someone says, I love you too quick, oh, run away and they don't mean it. And like all, of, all these things, man, that people keep in their head. Or if your husband looks at another girl, oh, you better leave him, you better watch him, he's cheating on, like all this stuff, man. Or you gotta have a man that has a good job and good health to marry or you're never gonna be successful, you end up in the fort. Like, they fill our heads full of so many cliches and rules when we're kids that it doesn't make you feel love, it makes you wonder for lust and go after the lust things and go after like 
silly principles or morals you made because you heard them over and over again. Kind of like brainwashing, right? I don't know, I kind of drifted there at the end, but... You can see how things have been replaced in such a short time. I'm pushing 50 this year, I'll be 50. So I've, I've only been here half a century, you know? But uh, I've seen enough to see how things have changed, man. Most people in the world only know lust. They don't know what real love is. Love is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's written in scripture, it's called the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And that's what love is. And they've changed that scripture, I don't know how many times, with different words. It might be one of the most changed scriptures over time. It's the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And I remember originally, and learned it again, like not long ago, as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And I think it's Galatians 5.22, but don't quote me on that. So... They change that because if you know that and you keep reading it and keep it in your head, you'll know and understand what love is. You put like an equal sign after the word love. And love is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if you keep those thoughts and keep those attributes in you, you will know what love is. And they also say you can't go to heaven unless you love God. So if you don't know what love is, and most of the world doesn't, how are they going to get to heaven, man? And that's what I've seen, like, through time. They make you lust through things and materials and certain standards and morals and people that you're with. It's not good. It's, it's not good. And that's the most important thing we should teach people, is how to love. Because if you don't love, you won't be able to love yourself. And you won't be able to go inside and be grateful for how you were created from God. And then give that love back to God. And then be able to share that love with other people. Even your enemies. Because you know they're created by God as well. And you forgive them. Like Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive me for they know not what they do. And if you know that, and you, it, the stuff will just rub off on you. No matter what anyone does to you. Even if they kill someone you love, you still understand it. It just wasn't them. It was the hatred and the demon in them. The devil in them. So. Alright, I'll end this. It's uh, 17 minutes. Portrait mode for all you folks who want to complain. <laughs> all the 12 views I get. Anyways, it's not about views. It's about reaching people. Some of you watch for that reason. And I know YouTube scrubs my numbers. I've been at 850 or 40 subscribers for five years now or more. As soon as I was told, if you put anything religious in your in your quotes, in your descriptions, in your thing, I started putting it on every video. God bless you. Jesus loves you. Yeah, sure as crap, man. Everything froze. No more views. No more recommendations. No more nothing. I put up a simple squirrel video when I first made YouTube, and I forgot the password, so it has like a hyphen between crying and hippie. And I put squirrel gets high on crack in garden hose. And it was just squirrels I feed out my window that were playing, right? They were playing with the garden hose. That thing got so many views, man. But anyways. And my other videos, if I put adults only or sexual content on the title, it'll get most views. Even with you guys who are looking, like I'm not trying to say judges or nothing, but it's just, it's how we're wired, man. Or if it's a violent video or about drama or talking with someone else, the gossip stuff that we're not supposed to do, people feed to it like fish. This internet is like the, the fruits from the, the tree of forbidden knowledge of good and evil. And you're not supposed to eat those fruits. And it's like the internet is just extending the branches in everybody's home, dangling the fruits in front of their faces to keep eating. Especially everyone that's into those conspiracy things. Because all the conspiracy stuff slowly exposes you to the evil knowledge that you're learning that they do, their rituals, their symbols, their demon names, all that crap that's not in the Bible, man. And all you need to know about evil to defeat it is in the Bible. You don't need to learn anything more about it. That's what it was all about with Adam and Eve. It wasn't about the temptations of God that he did. The devil knew if they'd eat the fruit, they're beat. If we eat the fruit, we're beat. If we don't love God and don't know what love is and you don't love yourself and you don't love other people, how are you supposed to love God and get to heaven? You see? 
Anyways, I'm going to cut this short. God bless y'all. I hope I've reached one of you. I hope you enjoyed my powwow story. And skeet shooting. Skeet. God bless you. Peace.